Please remain standing for just a few seconds. Jesus returned home, followed by this crowd. When his family heard about what he had done, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He, Jesus, has gone out of his mind, has gone out of his mind in the name of God, whose Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Typically, I, when I supply in the church, I preach from the pulpit. I never know what I'm getting into. And uh, I was supposed to be wearing a microphone, but I could not find a pocket where I could press the button. So I hope, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, in this particular gospel this morning, there are about a dozen sermons. This is not a typical gospel that we have. We, I, matter of fact, I have never, never, ever preached this gospel. But something caught my attention in this gospel, and this is what I want to talk about, because there's been a recent book published on this subject. People were saying Jesus has gone out of his mind. He is crazy. Jesus is gone. And so, you know, the question is, um, why, why did people think Jesus had gone out of his mind? Well, if indeed we need to find this out, there's one thing we learned to do in seminary. We, I think we should perhaps uh, go back a little bit prior to this morning's gospel. And if we look at the uh, previous uh, scene, prior to this scene, we will find Jesus um, entering a, a synagogue where uh, he discovers a man whose hand is withered and deformed. And as Jesus approaches this man with the withered hand, the Pharisees, his opponents, his opponents were watching suspiciously to see if this Jesus Christ from Nazareth would indeed attempt to heal this man on the day of the Sabbath. You see, they, the Pharisees and scribes, our Lord's opponents, uh, wanted very badly to catch him, trick him into something so that they accuse him and put him in jail. They wanted very badly to find grounds to accuse Jesus of, of doing the unholy thing of breaking the Sabbath. And as Jesus noticed these Pharisees staring at him, he, Jesus, looked at them and said, well, guys, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, of course. <laughs> well, guys, according to God my Father, it is lawful, according to Jewish law, I guess, it is lawful to do good or to do harm on the day of the Sabbath, to save life or kill life. In other words, he's saying one has free will. One has free will. Brothers and sisters, the Pharisees, after Jesus had said this, the Pharisees were immediately silenced as they fumed with anger. They fumed with anger. And even though Jesus returned his own angry, with an angry stare, as it says, he was still, as it says in our gospel, he was still grieved. He was grieved at the Pharisees' hardness of heart. Jesus never wants to see a hardness of heart. Well, to make matters even worse, Jesus went on and did what? He went on and healed the man anyway. And the Pharisees, in their anger, immediately began to caucus and whisper with the Herodians and whispered and caucused against Jesus as to how, in fact, they could destroy this crazy renegade named Jesus of Nazareth. And so, after Jesus healed this man with the withered hand, the deformed hand, he went on to heal many, 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 many other diseases in the area. So many, in fact, that eventually he had to escape. He had to flee to the sea with his disciples. Jesus escaped to the sea because, much to his surprise, this large crowd of people fought, were following him and falling at his feet and proclaiming him as the Son of God. And this infuriated the Pharisees and scribes and the elders, of course. And so later, after having appointed 
He did this in this very scene. He appointed the 12 disciples. He simply went home. And that's where we pick it up today. He went home. And we pick it up, and this is exactly where our gospel begins today. When it says, Jesus went home, and the crowd came together yet again. Uh, I'm paraphrasing again. And so they came together so quickly that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have time to catch a meal, catch a bite to eat. And when his family heard about all this chaos and about the strange things that Jesus had done, they went out to restrain Jesus, it says. For people were saying, this man, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, has completely lost his marbles. <laughs> well, brothers and sisters, after what I'm about to say to you, you might think, you will probably think that I've lost my marbles as well. I'm going to take Jesus up on his word. I don't think Jesus lost his marbles, but obviously others did. And what I'm about to say is the following. This perception of Jesus Christ acting crazy is absolutely accurate. It's accurate to say the least. You see, according to the usual thinking of people out there, according to the usual thinking of Jewish authorities back then, oops, according to the usual thinking of the Roman Empire, Jesus was not only radical, but absolutely and positively out of his mind as well. They had to see it this way. And those whom Jesus called to be his disciples were, were thought of as being just as crazy as Jesus. And so what? Where are we going with this? What does this mean? What in fact does this mean for you and for me this morning? What does it mean? Brothers and sisters, it means those who wish to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ must be willing to swim upstream. Those who wish to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ must be willing to take the heat resulting from the status quo of this secular world. Those who wish to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ must expect and must be willing to both be persecuted and ridiculed. That's what it means. Everything our Lord and Savior said, everything Jesus proclaimed, and everything Jesus did in his ministry went against the grain of normal societal thinking and perception of the time. And even today it does. All one has to do, we need to look, all we have to do is look at the Beatitudes. You've heard about the Beatitudes. You've, you've, you've studied them. The Beatitudes themselves, to the average person, are crazy. The Beatitudes are crazy, especially to those who, who know absolutely nothing about loving, who know absolutely nothing about making a loving sacrifice for neighbor, and especially to those who know nothing about the meaning of the cross, our Christian symbol, our Christian symbol of loving sacrifice. Of course, some people will see craziness when they read in chapter 5 of the gospel according to Matthew. I'm taking you to Matthew now. When it says, just listen to this, when it says, blessed are you, you are blessed. You are blessed when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. I know some brothers up in Cleveland and say, yeah, right. <laughs> You are blessed when people utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. They see even more craziness when they read as a result that they are to be happy about it. They are to rejoice and be glad. Of course, this is crazy to some people, especially to those who don't know any better and are... Um, in the earthly habit of repaying evil with evil, who are in the habit of exercising tit for tat. You know a lot of people out there like that. But if, if you and I want to rise 
rise to that level of being considered faithful, faithful Christians and faithful, faithful disciples, followers of Jesus the Christ, then we are not, we are not to repay evil for evil. We are to forget about tit for tat. Difficult call. Tall order. St. Peter tells us in his first letter that we are not to repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse. But on the contrary, we are to repay evil with what? With a blessing. That's hard. That's hard for me when I get upset. I don't want to repay people with a blessing. I want to give them a piece of my mind. And that's the challenge. That is the challenge. And I dare say, brothers and sisters, it is to this radical, crazy nature, indeed to this craziness, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ calls us this morning. As Bishop Curry, Bishop Michael Curry, I don't know if you know him, as he says, he's the Bishop of North Carolina, as he says in his recent book, just came out this year. His recent book entitled Crazy Christians. Crazy Christians. He says, we need Christians in the church who will follow the bold craziness of Jesus Christ and be brave, be courageous, and be audacious enough to do what? To love their enemy. He continues by saying, we need some crazy Christians in this world. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, of course I could stand here for an hour and talk about that, but I don't want to be run out of the Episcopal Church. <laughs> Our Lord this morning was declared as being out of his mind. I can't just walk and blow by that and start talking about Holy Spirit and sin. What's more, our Lord's family believed this. And as I stated earlier, Jesus was, according to them, out of his mind. He was out of his mind according to those who did not get it. But not out of his mind according to those back then who understood right away. And according to those of us today who know, according to those of us today who know the weight of the cross, who know the pain of the cross, and its benefits spiritually. You know what the football coaches said. I played for Cleveland Blimbo. Somebody from here is from West High. Yes, Cleveland. Right? And, and the coach used to say, no pain, no gain. And he's right. Everything takes an effort. Nothing's easy. Nothing's easy. In the words of Bishop Curry of North Carolina, he says this. He says, the ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world and all its wrongdoing are the very ones who actually change the world. Brothers and sisters, we need some crazy, the Episcopal Church especially, we need some crazy, we need some bold, we need some audacious, dedicated, and brave Christians in this year, 2015. We need those Christians who are crazy enough to love as Jesus loved. We need those Christians who are crazy enough to give as Jesus gave, to forgive as Jesus forgave. And finally, we need those Christians who are crazy enough to strive for justice, crazy enough to love mercy and walk with God just as Jesus walked with God his Father. Because of the, and so we answer that question and we say, you know, well, why, why do we need to do all of that? The Episcopal Church is a sacramental church. We don't need to worry about those kinds of things. Brothers and sisters, we need to do it because the radical nature this is kind of wordy, so I really want you to listen to this. The radical nature of true discipleship 
is not only a requirement, a requisite for doing the work of God, but is also defined and framed by a faith community's ability to answer the call to respond spiritually to God's call through Christ without the slightest reservation. This, brothers and sisters, this is the avenue upon which Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, blesses us, graces us with freedom, with deliverance from the power of evil and wrongdoing. Amen. Amen. Let us stand.